common? The Gila Monster. The Orchard Swallowtail Caterpillar. Yeah. The Peacock Mantis Shrimp. <laughs> they all have funny names. The Wonder Puss. Exit, stage left. How do they come up with these names? Like this. Ta-da! It's a fried egg jellyfish. Don't forget the secretary, bird. Or the blue ribbon eel. And me, a boscous monkey. Get the scoop on what's what with your call what. Wait, what? Your call what? Today, we meet a romancing bird who likes something borrowed and something blue. Sharon is going to love this. Discover why lizards love a lie in the sun. Want some sunscreen there, Greg? You're looking a little pink. And join the league of this superhero squirrel. I am a defender of all squirrels. What do you get when you mix a big mouth with a tiny fish? It's a jawfish. A jawfish. Will this take long? I'm very busy here. There are many species of jawfish living in the warmer parts of the Atlantic, Pacific and Indian Oceans. They make their homes in the reef suburban areas, away from the busy coral centres, in the outskirts on sandy flats. That's because they do this. They use their oversized jaws to dig burrows into the sea floor. Their mouths become earth-moving scoops. They stuff them full with sand and coral rubble and constantly spray sheets of it away from their doorsteps. So much sand! Who drags all this sand into the house? It takes a jawfish about eight hours to build their digs, but once their home is finished, they rarely leave. There's always housework to be done, though! Jawfish hover above their burrows, feeding on plankton and other small organisms that pass by. Would home delivery be too much to ask? I've been cleaning all day, you know. Jawfish are very protective of their burrows and will blast mouthfuls of sand at small intruders. Hey, I just cleaned that spot. Huh, no respect. When the day comes to a close and jawfish prepare for a night's sleep, they often cover the entrance of their burrows with rocks or shells to prevent home invasions. I don't like the look of that sea cucumber. You can't trust anyone these days. Jawfish, the reef's hard-working suburban housekeeper. Shoes off, please. You are not bringing sand in the house. What do you get when you cross a stylish black cap with a monkey? A black-capped capuchin. A black-capped capuchin. Good day, friends. I would tip my cap to you, but it appears to be somewhat stuck on. Black-capped capuchins are a Central and South American monkey that prefers the tropics. These monkeys live almost anywhere you can find trees, from coastal mangroves to rainforest. Capuchin monkeys are named after an order of monks. Oh, were they called monkeys? No, capuchin monks. When explorers first saw these monkeys in the 15th century, they thought the capuchins looked like they were wearing brown monk robes. Like many South American monkeys, such as the emperor and cotton top tamarins, the capuchins have seemingly odd hairstyles. You say odd, I say glorious. This is so they can tell which other monkeys belong to their own special family. Black-capped capuchins have grippy tails to help them move about. And like a human hand, they have moving thumbs for climbing and to break open food. Ah, oh, yes, these things. Extraordinary. Oops, missed a bit. They're also considered to be one of the most intelligent monkeys because they use tools. <laughs> Black-capped capuchins will collect stones good for cracking open food, like nuts and crab shells. Can you pass me the long stone? Bird draw down in the kitchen. They even make their own insect repellent. In the wet season, capuchins will crush up insects, like millipedes, to rub on their fur, which acts as repellent against mosquitoes. Well, that's just simple chemistry, really. Do keep up. The black-capped capuchin. The clever monkey hiding a whole lot of smarts underneath that black cap. Have you seen my quantum leap theory? <laughs> Great!
A group of buffalo is often referred to as a herd, but they also have a cooler group name. Is it a club of buffalo? Or a gang of buffalo? Or maybe even a mob of buffalo? If you guessed the second answer, a gang, you were right! Buffalo! It's a gang of buffalo. Hey, want to join my gang? There are two types of buffalo. The water buffalo, native to South Asia, and the Cape buffalo from Africa. These enormous mammals, which can weigh over a thousand kilograms, like to live in tropical and subtropical forests of Asia or in the grassland swamps and savannas of Africa. Buffaloes are fiercely protective of each other, taking care of sick and old members to keep them safe from predators, just like a gang. I heard Billy was getting sized up. We might have to go back him up. You with me, gang? Buffaloes are herbivores, which means they are strictly plant eaters. Yeah, that's right. Don't mess with a plant gang. Buffaloes have boy gangs and girl gangs. Mums and aunts stick together to raise calves, and the males leave it around three years old to join their own gang. Uh, no one mentioned we get together for mud baths. Buffaloes have extra wide hooves that stop them from sinking into mud at the bottom of swamps and rivers. And tell them about all the helmets. If you join the gang, you get a helmet. Cape buffalo horns have fused together across their heads to form a super tough layer of protection against lions and crocodiles. A gang of buffalo, the bonded buddies that stick together like flies on mud. Come on, join the gang. You know you want to. ID crisis. What do you get when you cross a desert walker with a reef stalker? It's a scorpion fish. What? A scorpion fish. Ah, I'm a scorpion, eh? Shall I prepare myself for a journey into the desert then? Scorpion fish are generally found worldwide in the warmer reef zones either side of the equator. Oh, is that a sand dune I spy ahead? Well, no, just small reef. These areas are far from being the deserts of the ocean. The vivid shallow coral reefs are the perfect hiding spot for a scorpion fish. This fish family is one of the largest in the marine world. There are well over 200 species worldwide. The desert-dwelling scorpion is renowned for the sting in its tail. The scorpion fish also has a nasty surprise if you get too close. Why limit yourself to a stinging tail when you can sting from everywhere? Its sharp spines are coated with one of the most toxic fish venoms in the world. And while scorpions like to hide under rocks, the scorpion fish becomes the rock. Yoo-hoo! Surprise! <laughs> scorpion fish are great camouflages. Different species will grow to look like coral, rocks and seaweed. Shall I work on my sand dune disguise for my foray into the desert to join my fellow scorpions? Bottom dwellers by nature, many scorpion fish even walk along the seafloor by using adapted pelvic fins. Oh, look! These fins seem entirely impractical for desert walking. I think I might just stay here on the reef. What do you think? Ultimately, a scorpion fish has all the traits of a fish. Gills, fins, and has to live underwater to survive. Okay, good decision then. Underwater it is. The scorpion fish. A lot of scorpion, but all fish. ID crisis solved. What do you get when you cross silky fabric with a nesty retreat and a bird? It's a satin bowerbird. What? A satin bowerbird. I know my feathers are shiny, right? Do you think my friend Sharon will like it? Satin bowerbirds are master builders, constructing their homes along the east coast of Australia. They build in wet rainforest in the north to drier woodlands in the south. The males have a blue-black feather coat with a shimmery satin sheen. Do you know who else likes blue? My friend Sharon. A bower is a name for a rustic dwelling, and these bowerbirds are master architects. 
they carefully select small twigs to place into a roofless corridor to create the ultimate love nest. Aww. Oh, Sharon is gonna love this. It's all to attract the attention of the females, which are an olive green colour. Do you know what this feather reminds me of? Sharon's dreamy blue eyes. He then draws attention to his bachelor pad with a little bling. He will steal anything from his surroundings in his chosen colour scheme, often appropriating from humans. I have no idea what type of feather this is, but I'm taking it. I'm taking them all. This satin bowerbird has collected blue feathers and even blue bottle tops to pave a path to love. I saw Sharon look at a blue straw the other day, so I'm going to surprise her with 1,000 straws! Other species, like the spotted bowerbird, prefer to deck out their cribs with white and green. The region bowerbird decorates its bower with yellow. They seem to choose to decorate their nests with colours most like their own. Ha, 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 there she is. Sharon, Sharon! Oh, I don't think she saw me. The Satin Bowerbird, a love-struck Romeo that uses blue to woo. Do you know what'll really get her attention next time she flies past? What? 2,000 straws. <laughs> Families. Say hello to the Deer family. Deer dads have their own special name. Can you guess what it is? Is it a bellow? Or is it a rack? Or a buck? If you said buck, you're in luck. A what? That's right. A male deer is called a buck. OK, I just want one decent family photo. All still and look at the camera and... Oh, dear Buck, you moved! Deer are found far and wide throughout the world, but the highest concentration of species is in North America in the Canadian Rocky and Columbia Mountains. They stick to meadows and forests for shade and good hiding places. Deer have long legs to walk through grass. They're also good jumpers and swimmers, which helps them escape from predators like coyotes, bears and wolves. <coughs> the deer family is a big one. There are over 60 different species of deer, including the white-tailed deer, elk, reindeer and even moose. The males are called bucks or stags. They have antlers. Female deer are called does and the babies are fawns. Just hold still. Mom! Honestly, dear, I just want you to look good for one photo. I don't have any way you aren't pulling a face. White-tailed does lick their fawns a lot to keep them free of scent. That's because they leave the fawns to hide in the forest for hours, sometimes days, while they go off to feed. And they don't want any predators to sniff out the vulnerable babies. Fawns. I want to try one last time. Kids, your mum's making us do this photo thing again. The deer family. As pretty as a picture. What do you get when you cross a handy tool with a head and add a shark? It's a hammerhead shark. A hammerhead shark. To get ahead in the building game, you just got to tell yourself you're going to nail it. <laughs> Works for me. The hammerhead shark can be found around the world in temperate and tropical waters. Hammerheads are usually found close to shore, patrolling through reefs. But these sharks do sometimes venture further out, exploring the depths of 300 meters. Just scouting around for any building work. I guess I was born with a head for it. Hammerhead sharks take their names from their flattened, hammer-shaped heads. These distinctive sharks use their oddly shaped heads to help locate prey. Having their eyes set at the end of their hammer shaped heads gives them a wider visual range. They also have specialized sensory organs on the surface of their wide heads which help them detect electrical fields created by other animals. When you're working with electricity, always play it safe and use a professional like me. With this natural toolbox of tricks, sharks have got it made when it comes to meal times. Hammerhead sharks enjoy fish, crustaceans, squid and octopuses to satisfy their appetite on their lunch break. 
to catch their favourite food, stingrays, they have a special trick. Unlike other sharks, a hammerhead's mouth is located on its flat underside, allowing it to scan along the seafloor for any stingrays that may be hiding. Who needs a bulldozer when I'm around? The hammerhead shark, using its brains and brawn to totally nail it under the waves. What do you get when you cross a seriously sunburnt neck with a juicy melon? A red-necked patty melon. A red-necked patty melon. Hi, I'm a red-necked patty melon. N nice to meet you. Aww. These super shy nocturnal marsupials can be found hopping along parts of the east coast of Australia. The forest floor is where they live, taking cover amongst low-lying vegetation. You, you, you want to play hide-and-seek? I know all the best hiding spots. The reddish fur on their neck and shoulders may look like they spent too much time in the sun, but helps them camouflage in the bush. I thought I had sunscreen in my pouch. Oh, it must have bounced out. The name Paddy Melon is based on Badamalian. The word for these creatures is from the Duruk Aboriginal language. Paddy Melons are macropods, close cousins to kangaroos and wallabies, just a whole lot smaller. When fully grown, a paddy melon's maximum height is about 62 centimetres, a little taller than a rock hopper penguin. Hey there, I found you! Another big difference between paddy melons and their kangaroo cousins is their tails. They're short and almost bare on a paddy melon. Kangaroos rely on powerful tails to help them leap away from danger. But paddy melons prefer to hide. Whoops, you found my spot. <laughs> In a paddy melon's never-ending game of hide-and-seek, there are a handful of creatures they do not want to be found by, including dingoes, feral cats, dogs and birds of prey. Come out, come out, wherever you are. Paddy melons wait until dusk to come out of hiding to grab a bite to eat. Grasses and leaves are their favourites to nibble on. The red-necked paddy melon, a shy treasure that's well worth seeking out. Come and play again sometime. A lizard loves nothing more than a nice lie in the sun. What do you call a group huddle of these relaxing reptiles? Is it a lounge of lizards? Or is it a lick? Or is it a snooze of lizards? If you guessed lounge, you were right. A what? It's a lounge of lizards. Can you keep the noise down, please? Some of us are trying to sleep. There are well over 4,000 different species of lizard found all over the world. Lizards come in very different shapes and sizes, but share one thing in common. They love to lounge in the sun. Oh, want some sunscreen there, Greg? You're looking a little pink. Lizards rely on outside surroundings, like the sun and water, to heat up and cool down enough to move around. Hey, my sunbed keeps moving. Oh, that's not a sunbed, Bob. You're lying on top of me. Lizards can be tiny or terrifyingly huge. Some tree-climbing geckos won't outgrow your finger, but the land-plotting lace monitor can be longer than a fully grown human. Many lizard species like to live in solitude, including the water dragon, frilled neck lizard and gila monster. You're my best friend. Otago skinks from New Zealand enjoy living in small family groups that soak up the sun together. Hey Ralph, can you hand me the remote? I'm in a good spot here. Really? A lounge of lizards, taking the art of reclining to a global level. <laughs> ID crisis. What do you get when you mix a happy hog with a rowdy raccoon? A hog-nosed raccoon. You're what? A hog-nosed raccoon. Everyone excited to find out exactly what we are? Raise your tails. Hi. Also known as Kowati, these forest foragers can be found from the southwest of the United States through to the rainforests of Argentina. They're part of the raccoon family, though there are some obvious differences from their North American relatives. 
Hey, cousin, come and join our party. Sorry, morning workout. Unlike raccoons, the hog nose isn't a fan of the nightlife. It's a daytime hunter and has a secret weapon for sniffing out a feed. Look, I don't want to mention it, but seriously, that nose? I think it's gorgeous. The hog-nosed raccoon has an amazing snout. The entire nose can bend from side to side. Time to work out the nose and flare, flare, flare. Just like a foraging pig, the hog nose can dig into corners to ferret out fruit, eggs and insects. Abdominal crunch time and twist. But unlike a pig, this tree dweller has another feature that makes it a great gymnast. Split leap and go! Hog nose raccoons have ankles that can rotate 180 degrees to help them climb up and down trees and rocks with the grace of an athlete. Yeah, there is no way you're getting me to do that. The hog-nosed raccoon, a bright-eyed and bushy-tailed acrobat that's never stuck in the mud. ID crisis solved. What do you get when you cross a crab's eyes with a goby? It's a crab-eyed goby. You're called what? A crab-eyed goby. Hey, I've got a great idea. Wanna play I Spy? These eye-catching fish are native to Australian waters. Bottom dwellers by nature, crab-eyed gobies inhabit sandy, silty and rocky sea floors around coral reefs. They take their name from the two dark spots on their dorsal fins, which look like crab eyes. I don't really see the resemblance. Oh, stop being so crabby. Some scientists have suggested they develop these spots to imitate crabs to help scare away potential predators. Crab-eyed gobies are loyal partners that pair up for life. Enough eye spy for one day. Time to go home and tidy up. Yep, dear. Living in burrows, aquatic housework takes up the majority of their time. I think sand spinning contests are much more fun than eye spy. Don't you, Cecil? <laughs> I totally agree. They use their mouths to scoop up sand and shell fragments and beat their tails to fan sediment out of their burrows. Oh, I wish I had a leaf blower. What do you think your tail's for? Stop wishing and get swishing. This constant housework seems to get on their nerves. Crab-eyed goby couples are known to argue and jostle while they work. Cecil, stop watching this game down there and help me sweep. Aye, aye, Captain. I get so crabby when he calls me that. Crab-eyed gobies keep themselves fueled up by filter feeding. They take a mouthful of sand and sift out any food, like worms and crustaceans. Cecil, I was thinking spit roast for dinner. You read my mind. <laughs> the crab-eyed goby, a sand-sifting little wonder. What do you get when you cross a superhero cape, the dirt beneath your feet and a keen-eyed squirrel? A cape ground squirrel. You're called what? A cape ground squirrel. Greetings, I am Captain Squirrel. I am here to fight for truth, justice, and the squirrel way. These superhero rodents can be found in countries that make up the southern cape of Africa, which is why they're called cape squirrels. There are two types of squirrels tree squirrels that like to hang out in trees and ground squirrels that stay put on the ground. That's why this crime-fighting critter is called the Cape Ground Squirrel. Alas, I cannot fly, but I am a defender of all squirrels. Cape Ground Squirrels dig and live in complex underground burrows that can have up to a hundred different entrances. These burrows serve to protect the squirrel from their arch nemesis, Snakes. They also share these burrows with other desert animals like the yellow mongoose, which also needs to hide from enemies. Ah, you think you can save your friends by hiding down here in your little burrow? Run away! You don't scare me. I have an entire superhero league with me. When threatened, ground squirrels band together to rush at a predator as a mob, waving their tails to try to scare them off. Like their tree squirrel relatives, 
Ground squirrels have large, bushy tails that make up around half of their overall body length. Speak to the tail, serpent. You win this time, Captain Squirrel. The Cape Ground Squirrel. Proof that not all heroes wear capes. Thank you, Captain Squirrel. That's all the thanks I need. Unless you have nuts. Do you have nuts? What do you get when you cross a lick of facial hair with a trigger and a fish? It's a mustache trigger fish! You're called what? A mustache trigger fish! What? Why am I called that? Is there something on my face? The mustache trigger fish can be found swimming throughout most of the Indo West and Central Pacific Oceans. You can spot a resident trigger fish in lagoons and coral reefs where they diligently gnaw away at the coral in search of food. They have a big black mouth and sharp teeth to bite into rubble, but they're really looking for tasty morsels inside. That fish with the moustache is a really noisy eater! Shh, where on the menu? They also use their formidable chompers to break through the outer shells of sea urchins, mollusks, crabs and tube worms. A moustache triggerfish may look like its eyes are rolling back in delight at its reef buffet, but the swiveling eyes help it watch for anything sneaking up while it feasts. Uh, you need eyes on the back of your head around here. Sheesh, can a fish eat in peace? This mustachioed fish is named for the black marking just above its mouth, but it's also called the Titan triggerfish. It's the biggest one out of about 40 species. Oh, just doing my workout. Ugh, gains. They're called triggerfish because they have movable spines on their back that can lock into an upright position, like a trigger, locked and loaded. They do this to wedge into small holes for safety, and the spines help them stay there. If anyone interrupts this nap, they'll be sleeping with the fishes. They're also underwater acrobats, twisting and turning on their sides, looking for the best angle to have a crack at the coral. Smaller fish love when they spot a moustache triggerfish chewing at the reef. It makes quite a mess, which means... Leftovers! The moustache triggerfish, the reef's messy eater with a little something on its face. <laughs>